Welcome everyone. This good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ariel. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, discussion forum on multi um, masculinities in Indonesia and East Timor. Just in case you haven't done so, please remember to switch your mobile phone in sound mode or off. Thank you. Um, before we start, I'd like to say that we acknowledge the traditional owners, the, later, the elders past and present of all the lands on which Monash University operates. And we will hear a few words of welcome from um, Prof Associate Professor Julian Mealy on behalf of anthropology. Thank you very much, Ariel. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm speaking in place of Professor Andrea Whitaker, who, in fact, is the, the convener of anthropology program. is unable to come today, and she asked me, would, would I say a few words in her place? And the first thing I'd say, is, I think, is welcome, Ariel, because uh, <laughs> we're still in the very early period of your of your time here, and I want to welcome you back. In fact, Ariel was a PhD graduate of the Monash anthropology program, and now it's looked like this, the sort of wheels come full circle now because you're back. Um, in the Monash Anthropology Program. And Ariel also is formally appointed in the Monash Asia Institute, so has a prof professorial role in those two parts of the university. And um, I have to say I've been very struck by your energy and all the initiatives that you've come up with in the brief time you've been here, so it's wonderful to have you, to have you here. And I also want to thank our speakers, Hani Nurhuda, who's some of whom are very well known here, um, Ben, uh, Effie, and uh, my colleague Sarah as well. Thank you very much for making yourself available for this worthwhile event. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. So um, I'd like to go very quickly with you on the running of the discussion. But before that, let me just give you some general rationale why we are here today. Okay. Life in Indonesia has always been strongly gendered and remarkably privileging the masculine. And I suspect the same was true in East Timor. I don't know, I'm not an expert at that, but Sarah is here with me to tell us a story. So has Indonesian studies. Indonesian studies has been strongly biased towards the masculine, particularly during the Cold War, when it falls under the rubric of area studies. But in spite of all that, or because of that, masculinity has never been a central theme in Indonesian studies. It has not been a current debate or central theme in conferences. As far as I know, there's not been so many special issues on journal or book series on masculinity in Indonesia or East Timor. It has been discussed in a topic of research among the few individuals and a few uh, low-key gatherings. But if you look at what happened in Indonesia throughout history, revolutions, guided democracy, new order, reformacy, it's basically a story of machismo, a very strong masculine assertion of power. Um, but because masculinity has not been appropriately and adequately addressed in Indonesian studies, people talk about nationalisms, militarism, developmentalisms when it comes to study of Indonesia. They talk about corruption, they talk about jihadism, they talk about decentralization, where in fact all of them are also a story of masculinity. So it is with great pleasure today that I welcome you to this forum where we have a new generation of scholars of Indonesia, I think trying to be, try to fill in that, that gap. And they represent, I'd say, some of the pioneering scholars in this new field. So I really am very grateful that they make the time, despite their pressure, of time and so on to come to this gathering. Um, we have uh, we have what, five people, four um, among us, and one in Canberra there. Um, I like to introduce you to them, and I like to ask them very quick questions about their research uh, projects, very basic questions, uh, um, so that they can introduce to us what their um, research are. But I also like to invite both the speakers, as well as everyone in this room, about the broader issues. This include why only recently have we become interested 
the new younger scholars become interested in masculinity. Why not in the past when I was a student, when some of us were still a student, okay? What does it mean for the study of Indonesia and East Timor that now masculinity get more attention? So this is the kind of question beyond the individual research, but if possible, I'd like to hear some of your views on this. This increase of the study of masculinity would change somehow gender studies in general. In what ways are they impacting gender studies? Does our specific gender position matter when you study masculinity in East Timor or Indonesia? Whether you are a woman or you men, will that be different? Whether, whether, when, whether that matters at all? Please tell us that story from, from your experience. So I will begin in the next about um, 40 minutes or so by asking individual researchers on their topics. And then I will invite if they would like to comment on each other. I will ask if Julian have an urgent burning issue to comment before I open the floor. And then we can discuss further the broader issues, okay? So let, now, let me now begin with the first couple of questions about um, the research topics and research projects of these um, four and five um, scholars, including the one uh, in Canberra. I'd like to ask them the first question, what exactly is the central research question that you want your thesis or your research project to answer? Okay. What do you want to achieve in your research projects? And why have you been interested in that projects? Can I begin with Honey first to tell us Okay, Her story. Should I start now? Please. Okay. So I have to. You don't have to be so close. Okay. As long as you're close. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my thesis is actually trying to understand how masculinities are defended, challenged, reshaped, and negotiated by men in relation to their profession as teachers in an Indonesian early childhood education setting. So it explores connection between subjective masculine identity, hegemonic gender culture, professional subjectivity, gender and pedagogical practices of early childhood male teachers by looking at how male teachers in ECE position themselves in a female-dominated field, how they give meaning to their experiences as male teachers, and how others, like their colleagues, uh, the students and the students' parents position them in the field and ultimately how they define their masculinity. So I am interested in uh, researching this topic uh, because I work in the field in ECE and I teach in a, in a early childhood teacher education program. And over the course of my career, 15 years career there, I only have five male students, and uh, only two of them graduate from the program. Uh, the rest of them transferred to another program, and also one day I overheard um, one of my colleague, who was also a man, commenting on uh, my student, the male students, uh, he throw jokes and uh, he asked my student whether whether he is still a man by being a student in early childhood education. So I think my student might might have faced a lot of challenges uh, studying in the field, trying to be a male teacher, and why should a man? questions his masculinity because of, you know, because he studied early childhood education. So that's what uh, triggered me yes. to do my research. Thank you. Can we move on with Huda? Okay. By the way, I'm sorry, I have not introduced um, the speakers. Uh, Honey is from the University of, of Melbourne. I circulated a copy of the sheet of paper with strong, uh, longer list of uh, backgrounds, uh, biodata of the speaker, so that I don't have to spend so much time on, on, on introductions. But please do have a look. If you need extra copy, I have some here. For anyone interested? Yeah. And Huda is currently completing her uh, is, uh, PhD dissertation 
with Monash University. Please, Huda. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, my main research question is, in fact, is uh, how far and what ways masculinity support and sustain the rest of Indonesian foreign fighters. Mm -hmm. I have been studying this subject as quite sometimes for a number of reasons. First is for, as a personal issue as well, because uh, I almost become a foreign fighter myself. When I was studying in Islamic boarding school, many of my friends being recruited that they end up traveling to Afghanistan and fight. And then when they come back, they involve a number of atrocities in Indonesia. It's personal. And second thing also, I have been exposed with a number of uh, uh, masculinity construction since very early on when I study in boarding school. For instance, through nasheed, through things, through, through the story of Quran. As a Muslim, I hear more story about the war rather than the peace within uh, in the life of Prophet Muhammad. So I don't think this is the case because uh, this is therefore I really want to understand whether what is exactly the rule of masculinity in terms of understanding the rise of constant radicalizations in Indonesia. Thank you. Ben Hikarti from the Australian National University is nearly completing his dissertation <laughs> on masculinity as well. Please, Ben. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Thanks, everybody. Um, so my thesis, um, I'll, I'll kind of start with a very broad question and hopefully narrow down. Um, but I'm interested in what ways um, the emergence of consumer capitalism and middle class culture more broadly from the late 1960s changed understandings of intimacy and gender in Indonesia. So how did men and masculinity and women and femininity take on the, the meanings that they come to have? They may seem very straightforward questions and, and these, these ideas and concepts may seem to have been naturalized kind of beyond a doubt, but they do indeed have a history. Um, that I'm interested in finding out. Um, I'm doing that through or approaching my research through kind of long-term ethnographic research with a group of old or older men and uh, gay men and wadiya um, who remember that period, the length of that period. So it's kind of like an ethnographic history um, of the new order from, from, the, from the late 60s to the, to the 1990s. So, but I'm interested uh, particularly in the way ethnographic research often takes, uh, can, can take you by surprise or things can take you su by surprise. In my case, it came uh, with, with the young men called Brondong. Does anyone know what Brondong is? No, you have to explain. You have okay. to explain. <laughs> this is, a, well, I, I recommend you can go out and watch a film that's really kind of bad and cheesy called Adi Sam Brondong. Evie can, can <laughs> fill us in about that. And Adi Sam Brondong actually, I think, says a lot about uh, who Brondong are, but they're basically adolescent uh, men and objects of desire who circulate in the mass media, often related to uh, consumption, I would say, uh, the market, urbanization, and so on. Right. But, but Brondong is also, by the way, popcorn. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's popcorn, is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <I see. laughs> Something like that you have with when you have entertainment. So yeah, so that's an and that's a lo that's an excellent way to um, introduce the role that they played. So in my case, just to say briefly, I met one Brondong who called himself the Corporal. Right. He was not a real army corporal, but he gave himself that name. Right. He's also a sex worker. Um, and what I found so interesting was, was his description of his body as an asset. And to me, that really evoked some of the, the kind of important themes about changing ideas of masculinity, kind of in the long shadow of the developmentalist and um, authoritarian new order. So that's my, my research. Thank you. Can we not turn to Evie? I have the honor to be her supervisor. So sad to leave her in Canberra. but. No, we still connected uh, virtually. So please, Evie, tell us your research project. It's like uh, having a thesis consultation in public, by Ariel. <laughs> uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah. OK. So I'm specifically interested in exploring how the deeply rooted ideal masculinity, which many scholars called as Bapaism, is attempted to be transformed by the young, urban, educated middle class in commercial cinema. Well, just a um, short story about Bapakism. Bapakism is a kind of masculinity uh, which con the configuration um, practices which legitimize men's authority as patron leaders of family collectivity, which also extends to the nation. I want to know basically what sort of alternative ideal masculinity is projected to replace this Papa is a masculinity in the 21st century Indonesia. 
Of course, there are myriads of alternatives in cinema in everywhere. The, so I eventually narrowed down my investigation to a particular form of masculinity. So the more caring and nurturing, um, and also the kind of um, not primary breadwinner type of masculinity, which um, for um, masculinity scholars is known as new man masculinity. Then I investigate how this representation is projected to replace the status quo Babaism and how this representation is made possible on screen. So eventually, um, I would like to know what can, what can the struggle of um, legitimization of this representation tell us? What can it tell us about the contemporary gender politics in Indonesia? Um, I'm motivated by um, first academically as you said, that there has been a very minimum discussion on masculinity, let alone in cinema. When it comes to the subject of gender politics in Indonesia, people are talking more now about femininity and women. And as if like, you know, men will never change or masculinity will stay that way. So I'm more interested to ask whether, is it really stay that stable? Of course not. And I'm more interested in investigating um, representation of masculinity in cinema screen because cinema provide, to me provides powerful and convincing representations of reality. So what is considered as normal and not normal, attractive, unattractive, and so forth. This is also a gap in um, the knowledge that I'd like to address when we talk about gender politics. It often leads to the discussion of state policies or civil society's movement. I would like to show that commercial cinema is also an important front of gender politics. There, are, This is an arena which is often treated with suspicion for its commercial nature, like what happens in, a, in cinema stays in cinema. It's never happened you know, outside cinema. But in many cases, it has proven that commercial cinema has dialectic relations with politics of screen. And my, I also have a personal reason on um, researching masculinity, which makes me always like uh, emotional. I experience like the uh, turn of the millennium uh, has propelled rapid changes in gender patterning um, in Indonesia, especially uh, in 1997, 1998, we've got like massive economic changes, which changed a lot of things in the patterning of gender relations of labor. I was 17 at the time, and then um, I found that one day coming home from school, I found my father, who has never been drunk before, he came home drunk because he was so frustrated. His masculinity was challenged. So I guess this is not only my experience, but experience of many other families in Indonesia because of the very strongly um, entrenched hegemonic masculinity that men has to be breadwinners, have to provide um, livelihood for the family. And then when it's suddenly gone and um, you know the, the sense of masculinity is challenged. So I wanna know more in a larger scale what happened and then how it uh, you know kicked the ball rolling in changing masculinities in Indonesia. Thanks. Thank you, Evie. Well, I would like now to invite my colleague from Topology, Sarah Schneider. Um, she's been doing study on masculinity in East Timor. Please, Sarah. Thank you, Ariel. I just take this one here. Now, I feel a bit like the odd one out because I'm no longer doing my PhD and haven't been for a very long time. And also because I'm talking about East Timor and not Indonesia, even though <clears throat> there's been a lot of Indonesian influence in East Timor and that's part of the reason I became interested in Timor because I met um, lots of solidarity activists in Australia who were helping the Timorese um, with their struggle for national independence. So that's how my interest was um, begun with East Timor. So I've been involved with East Timor for over 20 years now, which is t feels like a terrible thing to say and a terribly long time. But uh, 
my interest in masculinity has really come out of writing the biography of one of the main Timorese leaders, Shanana Guzmao, which was my PhD thesis all those years ago. But thinking about the dominance of male leadership in Timor and the real struggle women leaders have had to have a voice, uh, and it's not a very strong voice still today. And I guess my interest in masculinity has been to try and understand that because as a feminist, I began working with women's movements in Timor um, in 2000 when uh, we could travel there freely and easily after the Indonesian occupation. So, but in working with the women's movement, I had to look at the opposite, and that was the male leadership and why were they so dominant um, and why there felt like there was a contraction of the political space for women um, when a national independence came and men took all the, all the leadership positions. So I guess my motivation in thinking about masculinity and writing about masculinity in East Timor really has been to deconstruct this hegemonic masculinity that exists um, and to look, and I've been trying to write, I'm nearly finished, I think I've been working on it for a couple of years now, a history of masculinity in East Timor, looking at the indigenous aspects, looking at the effects of Portuguese colonialism, looking at the effects of the 24-year Indonesian occupation, a very militarised period in East Timor's history, which has had an effect on those male leaders that uh, came to run the country after the occupation ended. They were all ex-soldiers. I sometimes joke that it's a bit like the RSL running a country um, in East Timor. But uh, I guess that's the interest that I've had is to try and deconstruct that and unpack it and to look at what's going on, uh, really in working with feminists in Timor, working with the women's movement in Timor, working with this very small and unsupported men's movement in East Timor, one of whom we've had come and speak with us at Monash before, um, a colleague of mine from Timor. Uh, but, and I guess my motivation to continue with it is to try and support this very small men's movement that isn't given an easy time by the hegemonic uh, masculinity that exists there today. Thanks, Sarah. Once again, welcome to those of you who just join us. Um, we are now at the moment are inquiring very briefly the research a project, five different scholars. But the broader question we have to address later is why only recently this topic has become so popular. I was quite struck by the fact that I could find so many people in Melbourne and a couple in um, Canberra are studying this particular topic which, have wasn't, which wasn't there when we were students, you know. So it's something new. Why only now that people get interested in masculinity? We'll come back to that. But I'd like to uh, ask a bit more questions to these five scholars about their own individual research projects by asking perhaps um, what are some of the most important findings so far from their research? I'd like to reverse the order from now Sarah again. Mm. If you can share with us some of the most surprising, most important perhaps findings okay. that you've got. Well, I guess it's not surprising. <laughs> I've been writing about the militarized masculinity that exists in Timor. When we think about um, who's in charge of some of the main institutions in East Timorese society, who holds political office, who controls the government, the parliament, the institutions of state. Uh, and it's the men that led the military struggle against Indonesian occupation. Um, and they obviously uh, had very, very difficult lives and have been brutalised by some of their experiences fighting um, for their country and the type of aggressive politics that is set up by when men like that are in charge and the lack of political space that gives to other voices, to marginalised voices, to women's voices, to other different types of men. Um, so I think that's one of the main findings is to try and describe this type of militarised masculinity that, domi that dominates politics. Mm -hmm 
and 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 social life in East Timor, um, but also uh, the fact that I, I feel like it's been responsible for certain uh, backward steps, I guess, in the development of the nation. So when we think about the 2006 crisis that happened in East Timor, I really do uh, think that the responsibility lies at the feet of some of these more aggressive, militarised hmm. uh, masculine leaders of East Timor. Um, and I think people did take a step back from that mm. at that time when they realised the full extent that these types of aggressive politics could mm. go to. Mm. Um, and I do think things have have been brought back um, a level. I think it, even they were frightened of what, what was unleashed at that time. Um, so that's interesting. But I, I was interesting too what Evie said before about thinking about what replaces this then. Mm. This is a particular generation of men mm. who are ageing and it is an ageing political leadership. So what replaces them? What other sorts of masculinities exist in Timor um, to replace these, these, these ageing leaders? Um, and what are the more positive forms of masculinity? And I guess I've been trying to also think about this small men's movement and the activism that they do and the type of masculinities they're promoting um, and giving them some support. They're quite a struggling group um, of, of men. Uh, and I think another interesting finding has been the idea around domestic violence mm -hmm. and the aspect of this, this type of masculinity that has to control women. And one of the aspects of control is domestic violence. Uh, and also some new ideas around um, societies which have uh, a sociality, where men have a sociality where their allegiances are to each other and where there's a, a real um, homosociality, I guess, amongst men. Um, and this often results in more domestic violence. Mm. So there's this disassociation, I guess, from women that, that leads to these aspects. So those sorts of findings are mm. coming out. Mm. Uh, and I think they're probably the most uh, interesting and important ones Thanks, Sarah. so far. <laughs> Let's go to Effie now, because it's so well connected to what you just said. Mm. Yeah. Uh, share with thanks. us your, your findings, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll share like two important findings. First is masculinities in Indonesia in 21st century are reconfigured around whether men, in order to be ideal masculine, have to be breadwinners and to be the ultimate authoritative figure of family collectivity and to be heterosexual. And um, the strategy to legitimize new man masculinity as an alternative ideal through cinematic representations show that while male breadwinning practice has become more compromisable, male authority in family collectivity and heterosexuality are still the toughest barrier um, towards more equal patterning of gender relations. Well, um, compromise of breadwinning practice is considered as not only rational, but also ethical um, decision for the sake of more egalitarian relations of However, male authority in family collectivity and male heteronormativity are still largely maintained as normal, if no longer considered as natural, uh, masculine configuration of practice. And um, religious injunctions are currently deployed to preserve these two. And any challenges against these two will likely generate controversies and uh, fierce resistance. Thank you. Ben, can you share with us? Thank you. Yep. Um, so yeah, um, I mean, just to, to also to add that I, I think that my um, kinds of the findings that I have been, have, or the conclusions that I'm coming to, have also developed in conjunction with the emergence of the field of transgender studies, um, which has kind of had a remarkable energy um, and level of engagement with questions of gender and kind of trying to transform um, how we think about gender. But to start at like a basic level, um, Exactly as, as Evie has, has said, hegemonic understandings of masculinity and femininity in Indonesia are in fact um, rather recent. 
that they're not kind of timeless um, and natural, as as some uh, try to argue. Um, I found that motherhood, um, in particular, uh, continues to almost singularly define uh, what it is to be a woman uh, and femininity in Indonesia, which animates all kinds of anxieties about women who are not or cannot be mothers and limits the lives that, that women and, and men can have. So that's kind of the, the broad level. Can you specify how recent, recent is this? Sorry? You said it's a recent phenomenon. Well, how recent is it? Well, early 1970s is, is kind of where I'm tracing this hegemonic ideal. Okay. Of course, in practice, there's, there's lots of diversity. Um, but yeah, the, the, the kind of early 1970s, I, I kind of see most of these transformations taking place. But on the other hand, um, as, as lots of scholars of Indonesia have pointed out, Susan Brenner, um, I think, is, is such a seminal text for understanding masculinity in Ind Indonesia that while this might be, you know, men might be uh, kind of presented as having this kind of behavior, uh, kind of rational, uh, in control, in fact, it, it's women often who are those who, who are, uh, in a sense, behind the scenes, but sometimes very much visibly um, able to domesticate men's desire. Um, and I think that's a really important point that she makes. But either which way, there are, uh, what I found is that there are other um, kind of uh, modes of desire well outside of heteronormative logic. So the brondong again, uh, for example, object of desire, but adolescent, juvenile, infantilized, right? He's kind of a peculiar one. And I'm calling him a liminal man, which is to say that he's not liminal in the sense that he's feminine or feminized, which would be the very uh, kind of heteronormative logic at the level of analytics. But I'm saying he's liminal in the sense that he's not yet a full man um, and that he struggles to, 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 to be so in a society where masculinity is still marked by marriage and the family. And so I'm thinking that my main contribution is to say that kind of life course aspirations really matter in thinking about gender. Um, and that when we're thinking about gender, we need to think not in terms of masculinity or femininity as wholes necessarily that complement one another, but that stories about femininity tell us something about masculinity as well and vice versa. So that's Thanks. Mm. Uda. I think I need to look at also my research here because in my research I look at my study in the study of masculinity, intersection between masculinity and political Islam and international conflict. I argue that because I use a life history, throughout my interview I learned that individual decision of my sources with this former Indonesian foreign fighter, their decision to be masculine in specific way, which is being Mujahid, is a political decision. And, they, and, they, and to achieve that decision, it is not instant. It's a, no one get up in the morning and become a, a foreign fighter. It's a through, through gradual process. And that gradual process, uh, they use a cultural basis, for instance, and it is just th th being a martyr or fighting is only continuation of existing masculinity, including Japanese masculinity, being Kesatria, or maybe uh, like a masculinity against the, you know, like a, like a Pang for instance, when I asked one of the sources about why you do the jihad, because he said it has been around in Pangeran di Ponegoro, for instance, the idea of imperialism also, and also has to do with the global political Islam. Yeah. What I mean by global political Islam here is what happened in Indonesia has 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 to do also what happened in in the landscape after Iran revolution in 1979, changing the whole landscape. How Muslim as Ummah, you know, started to think themselves differently. And then they use international conflict as a way to perform their masculinity. So, so in this in this sense, the Indonesian foreign fighter masculinity is in fact the struggle of subordinate masculinity, which is their subordinate against the hegemonic masculinity of a Suharto, secular, and other things. And if if you look at the parallel within the Islamism debate. There is a, we can find in the writing of the guy named Said Qutub. He's one of the Islamic scholar who con, con divided the world only to the struggle of a jahiliyyah, the ignorance, and you know, the pharaoh, which is the, the edge of the secular. So now I think why we keep seeing now number of foreign fighters, because I think it's just only being a martyr, is, uh, being a fighter, it's just only the continuations of the existing culture already exists. In, in, in ancient Indonesia, even long before all the story of Wayang, Mahabharata, the, the glorification of being martyr. So I think this is 
one of my findings that I think uh, is important to look at. We cannot look at this issue merely through security approach, but also through mm. gender aspect as well. Thank you. Hani, would you like to share with us? Thank you. Um, well, just adding up to what Effie said and Ben and Paaril as well and Sarah, um, my research is looking at um, how men who work in female-dominated field, like all this time when I uh, look for research about gender and work in Indonesia, it's all dominated by women and work, like how women struggle in men uh, dominated field, how how to, you know, how to make the this masculine field approachable or accessible to women. There's no research, as you know, uh, I found that talk about how men work in female dominated field. I found research about that in Western context, but not yet in Indonesia context. Mm -hmm. So then I look at men who work in early childhood education, which is um, very demanding of love and care practices, nurturing, caring practices, uh, something like that. And I, I see how men actually can uh, you know, use this discourse of love and care and love and care practices to overcome the sense of masculinity, masculinity crisis. So all this time, when I read the literature, what men do to overcome the sense of masculinity crisis, they will turn to other masculinist discourse like you know violence, like domestic violence, and then like drugs, things like that. But in my uh, research, I found that these men who work in ECE, who teach young children, are able to adopt love and care, which is perceived to be feminine, as part of their masculine identity. Mm-hmm. They even said that, oh, men is caring. We're not learning how to care. We are, we are caring. And also, they talk about how uh, they think that Indonesia need more heart than brain. So we, he, one of my uh, respondents said that, uh, oh, we already have lots of people who are pintar, you know, have brain intelligent, but they don't have heart. That's why they do corruption. So <laughs> they linked it to that. So they think that we need more, more people who use their heart, they, their conscience. So it's. I, I think this is very uh, valuable for understanding masculinity in Indonesia in the current contemporary time. Thank you. I have one question for everyone, the speakers, um, before we turn into discussion. And that is because, <coughs> as I understand it, this is a rather recent um, trend in the study of Indonesia, uh, masculinity. Let's give due credits to those who have inspired us. I'd like to ask every one of you if you can tell us one scholar that might have inspired you strongly in your research work. Shall we start with you, mm. Sarah? Well, for me, I, I think it was Raywan Connell, really. Mm. Um, and I did try to copy her in the history. She wrote the his- history of masculinity in the whole world. And that's where I got this idea about writing the history of masculinity just in East Timor. So I think she has been, but there's also a little group of um, academics at the University of Sussex who I went to visit uh, at the end of last year at the Institute for Development Studies around a woman called Andrea Cornwall. Um, And they've written some really great um, stuff on masculinity and development and development who have also, I use a lot of quotes from them in my work as well. They've been very good. Thank you. Effie, what about you? Um, basically it's the same, Rywin Connell. I really admire her works um, and also her idea of con- hegemonic masculinity, which inspires me, uh, which helps me understand that uh, relation among masculinities and uh, 
and between masculinity and femininity are never neutral and never stable. But on top of that, uh, um, in addition, I'm also inspired by Michael Kaufman, um, a scholar of uh, masculinity as well, um, who introduced the idea of, you know, um, who also historicized um, the emergence of more caring and nurturing uh, type of masculinity in the West. And I found that um, this kind of masculinity is also emerging in Asia lately. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Great. Um, I'm going to say, it's such a hard question, but I'm going to say um, Benedict Anderson. Um, just because mm. thinking about masculinity, that, that classic essay on power in Java, if you read it, like reading it again the other day, I was like, wow, this is actually all about masculinity in so many so many ways, but but um, apart from that, I, I just love the way he can weave together um, social theory with a really de deep cultural historical knowledge of Indonesia. Java um, particularly. Java particularly, yeah. his kind of um, courage in going back to Indonesia despite being banned, and his commitment to um, Indonesian scholars and activism, I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. What about you, Huda? I think uh, at what Said. It was it influenced me a lot, especially his book on Orientalism. So the way we, I think, like reading him, make me think I need to come up with more kind of southern theories or indigenous way to look at the, the rise of foreign fighters. And then, so this is started with started with Edward Edward Said. Then I look at the work of Rowan Connell and of course the work of Kimmel. Kimmel look uh, especially when he did work on. You know all the right-wing activists. Mm -hmm. So you know what a militarized masculinity mm -hmm. and all of those. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, Honey. same as Sarah and Effie. I think Ryan Connell. <laughs> <laughs> wow, she's the heroine. Yeah, she is. She is the hero. <laughs> she she makes me understand how masculinity is not, uh, you know, it's not singular. It's like uh, it's plural, and there's hierarchy where one masculinity is more respected than other. Yeah. And also, I also like love the work of Eric Anderson about inclusive masculinity. It's, uh, it makes me understand why uh, in Indonesia, men are very, very uh, required to show the <laughs> to show the, the, the masculine, you know, the masculine feature or the masculine marker. So Eric Anderson, is to Anderson talks about homohistory culture, mm -hmm. where in the West it's becoming less and less homohistory. Mm -hmm. In Indonesia it's still high. So yeah, I like those words. Thank you, thank you. So we have heard all these five different uh, research projects. We would like to go beyond the individual research project and ask the broader questions. So um, I have already mentioned to you some of those broader questions. Why only recently that a lot of students of Indonesia turned their attention to the question of gender, particularly uh, masculinity? We ask whether um, this growth of interest in masculinity studies will impact the future of the study of Indonesia or in Sistimor. If at all, does it will that impact the study of gender in general, gender uh, gender studies? Whether one's gender position matter in the study of particular masculinity in a particular country in a particular setting? These are the broader question that I have. Uh, but before that, let me just now turn to the speakers and just check if any one of you, including Effie, would like to comment on each other very quickly. Is there anything that you would like to raise? to add up on Ben's point about um, how the uh, idea of hegemonic masculinity in Indonesia was kind of, you know, getting stronger in 1970s. Um, yeah, I, I agree on that, that, um, you know, at that time, uh, the state sort of uh, showed, what is it, more like support towards a particular form of um, masculinity, which I previously called as Babakism. But the idea of Babakism itself like originated from, um, you know, much older uh, mm -hmm. philosophy of masculinity from Java. So, um, uh, especially the um, elites of Java. 
uh, if we can historicize that, I believe that, you know, um, it's getting stronger at the turn of um, the 20th century. So um, late 19th century, there was a, you know, maybe you can call it like um, massive change and or maybe a reorganization of gender patterning in um, Java basically um, at that time. And also, it was also influenced by the uh, modernity, um, the Western modernity that came um, with the Dutch colonialism at that time. We can discuss more about that. Yeah. Anyone else would like to comment on each other's presentation? Um, yeah, Please. On, just on honeys, I really like the, the idea of um, presenting care as your an essential analytic mm -hmm. in gender. And I was just wondering, you know, beyond work, what what kinds of examples that because what we're I mean the hegemonic masculinity we're kind of suggesting uh, is not very nice um, it's kind yeah. of you know very kind of brutal and, and harsh and so on but mm -hmm. you're kind of suggesting that that in practice masculinity uh, is enacted or or produces relations of care um, and I really I really like that idea and I'd like to hear more about it oh, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, so you mean masculinity in the practices mm, beyond work I guess you know in everyday life do they Oh, beyond yeah. work from mm. from my data. Mm. Yes, because I asked them whether uh, whether they they experience a personality changes after they work as teachers in kindergarten, and they said, "Oh, yeah, I become more aware of my surrounding. I become more empathetic, like empathy. I have more empathy. Mm. Like I care of other people more than before." And one of my respondents gives an example when he saw uh, an old lady uh, going to cross the street. Mm -hmm. Usually, he just like uh, he doesn't care. He didn't care. And but now, after he become a teacher, he become like you know caring to, to the to the, the the old lady and ask whether she need help and things like that. And also, they said that. Oh, it's amazing to realize or to see the changes in me before I don't care about the small children. But now, even outside work, outside the school, I, be, I, I, I become to have interest in caring for children, for any children. Okay. That's what they said. Thank you. Thanks. Sir, you want to say anything? Yeah, I think I want to follow up what Hani says. And because when we talk about hegemonic masculinity, we tend to talk about, we think of it always about violence, you know, to achieve a specific domination man use of violence. To my surprise also, when I interview all my sources, the very reason they travel abroad to fight, they don't want to exercise violence. They just want to help those who oppress. So they travel out of caring rather than out of aggressiveness. This is same. So, and second thing also, they glorify people when cry. Oh, this guy praying and he cries, and he's a good man. I thought, okay, being a good man, carry AK-47 and kill someone. No, you stay at night, you cry and pray, and this such a strong Muslim mujahid, you know. Which for me, so the image of hegemonic masculinity doesn't mean always violence, you know. Uh, so thank you, Hanito bring this up so <laughs> make me one of the possibility to look at differently well I I wonder um, I, I guess I haven't said it yet but yeah. one of the main motivations behind deconstructing masculinity is to think about gender equality mm -hmm. and hopefully promoting gender equality uh, and deconstructing that hegemonic masculinity in the hope that we can just pull it apart and <laughs> um, replace it with something new. So I, I wondered if people could comment on that in their work, this idea of gender equality and how that fits in with their program of study, really, or their project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Effie would. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, um, the the representation that I'm focusing on, the new man masculinity is also projected as uh, more egalitarian, although like, you know, you, uh, it's not like what the feminist um, imagine to be. So for example, these men, uh, these men who adopt a new man masculinity tend to be uh, 
present to uh, what is it? They they comp they they are uh, they are willing to compromise their breadwinning role. For example, they may not be the breadwinner or may not be the primary breadwinner because it's an ethical uh, decision that they would allow their wives to work um, and also um, be uh, involved in the public sphere. For example, but then um, this human also has a drawback because they uh, still cannot. Uh, what is it give up like you know an, I'm the man of the house or something like that yeah there 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 is change towards equality but you know um, it's like I believe it's like a process it's like a you know mm. small progress like a small step. yeah right before yep. I, thank you mm -hmm. before we turn to the general discussion I see if um, Julian has something to comment in general and leading us to the kind of question that we should address um, in the next hour or so. Well, thanks, Ariel. I, I think that um, it's a good idea to move on to the, to the uh, general discussion, but I, I like your question about why only recently have we come to consider masculinity as an important topic for studying. I think one answer to that is that feminism was clearly the prior and more urgent political project, and I think, in fact, it still is, to be honest, at this point in time. But we've realised, I think, that in order to resolve some of these big-ticket issues that are facing women in the world now, various kinds of violence and exploitation and vulnerability and health and economic matters and so on. That masculinity is really our part of the part of the mix, I think, in resolving in resolving those issues. But I think I agree with uh, Sarah's just point that Sarah's the point you just made about gender equality. I think it's interesting we have five different sort of fields in which our speakers have uh, brought their insights uh, one is the teaching profession, of course, which is a really explicitly gendered uh, field of labour, I think. Um, the other is the field of Islamic schools, which is a, it's got its own specific codes of masculinity that we find there. And Nord Huda points out that this, we're dealing with Javanese culture here as well, not just the kind of textual notion of Islamic masculinity. Ben, I think, is reminding us that we all live in a world of consumption. And in fact, I, I really would like to hear you talk about a bit more about how that diversifies the range of, of, of masculine possibilities. I think that's a very fascinating, mm -hmm. fascinating question. Um, with Effie's been talking about cinema, cinematic representation, and um, my, my question would be actually that I'm a bit surprised to hear you say that the cinematic representation is a field for conflict over new possibilities. When in my, in my perception of it, I think perhaps a general perception of it might be that in fact. This is where we get our pointers about ideal, you know, normative ideals about how to be a man. Generally, they come from cinema, uh, cinematic representation, and from um, related genres, television, and so forth. I think surely that's where we get our cues about how to be a real man from. Um, but so I'm interested to know about that. Um, and Sarah, I think, is talking about public political life and a, a very, I guess maybe typical situation where, where memory of a recent revolutionary struggle that was harsh and heavily um, militarised provides some kind of bulwark perhaps for an ongoing masculine idea that is causing terrific, contributing to pr terrific problems for East Timorese uh, women um, at the moment. I think that's enough. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Some questions. Uh, Effie, you want to quickly address what... Yeah. Sure. That's an interesting question. Um, what I mean is that um, people tend to think that a cinema is highly conforming to the idea of hegemonic masculinity. That's why you get this idea of hegemonic masculinity and people like, you know, um, enact it in their real life. But cinema, commercial cinema is less likely to be the arena of confronting this hegemonic masculinity. So I'm looking at that, you know, at that point of uh, cinema as um, a, an arena where um, hegemonic and um, alternatives are actually encountering each other. And um, at one point, maybe these alternatives are the winners, not the hegemonic one. Thank you. Thank you. So we have still about an hour for discussion. Uh, I'd like to reserve the last 10 minutes or so for the speakers to make the last comment and Julian as well. So it's now to you. Um, the audience, uh, if you'd like to comment, questions, um, challenge the speakers, and contribute your new ideas to this topic that is not necessarily my area of expertise, I would be most grateful. Start with Lisa. And if I don't know your name, please do identify yourself, where you're from, what your name is, and so on. Would you like me to use 
Be please, yes, we do need to do I'd just like to echo what Julian said in terms of the history. If you look at the Centro Southeast Asian Studies, it was established by three men. So a lot of the women who came into the field actually were allowed in by men. But those women actually often um, contested the male perception. And um, it, you know, a lot of um, women who came through here were very influential in terms of influencing Indonesian history as well as um, the men. Yeah. And gender was often in the 1980s, often, you know, hot debates on the on the topic. And I don't, although you're centering now on the, the specific word of masculinity, um, I think that the issues were debated from so many different perspectives as scholars are taught to, you know, to look at an issue from many different perspectives. Yeah. And... I think that um, although perhaps women didn't, you know, write only on masculinity, it's because they were trying to um, challenge the the current perceptions that men automatically had right to make decisions. Mm. They were, you know, challenging the status quo basically, and um, but that doesn't mean that they weren't thinking about the issues that you are now. And mm. I'm not saying that your research isn't original or research in its own way is original mm. because we all come to things from different perspectives. But I think I, from my own experience in the 1980s, these issues were looked at you know, in many different ways as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm David Mitchell from Monash. Um, and, um, I think that Indonesian political culture has actually been fairly tolerant of w women as leaders. And I mean, we've got these eight Srikandi amongst Jokowi's ministers, but also I think there's been a tolerance of what you might describe as feminine characteristics amongst uh, the male leaders. I mean, I think you can, if you, um, if you look at uh, Gustur and Jokowi and, and Shanana, mm. I think you can say that these are all leaders whose strength is as negotiators and networkers, that they're more tolerant and more caring as leaders. And so this is a very different style uh, compared to the hyper-masculine authoritarian dictatorship. Mm. Uh, I don't, I'm actually surprised no one has taken this up, so I invite you to do so. <laughs> Thank you, David. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you did that because when we say masculinity, of course, we don't mean men. We don't talk about men versus women. We talk about masculinity that can be embraced by both men and women mm -hmm. and vice versa. Uh, so please do not confuse. Thank you. <laughs> please. I have to say I disagree with you greatly <laughs> about Shanana that he is one of the most authoritarian leaders and the, the, the facade of, of, of him being a consultative leader just it, and it, it's getting more extreme as he ages this authoritarian style mm. I have to say um, and I was looking uh, when I mentioned the, the people in Sussex University, I had this quote and I think about it a lot in regards to Shanana and some of the other leaders um, who, who, who aren't with us any longer because of these disputes that have happened. And it's about um, how masculinities as a field is, I'm just going to read this little quote here from Andrea Cornwall and some of the people from Sussex. The field has helped disrupt patriarchal knowledge power systems and make room for new questions to be asked of sexuality, intimacy, as well as violence and trauma in men's lives. So thinking about how these notions of masculinity have affected um, men and leaders like Shanana as well, and through these sort of brutalised experiences, they become the authoritarian leaders that they that they have. Um, and that, that's a really important part of what we're doing to deconstruct these things. Um, because these masculinities hurt men a lot, as mm. you know, as well as this sense of the society and the gender equality that exists within it. Um, yes, just about Shanana. I, know, I don't want to argue with you, but what I would say was that Shanana was successful when he was a negotiator, a man who negotiated a peace, a man who wrote poetry. Once he was 
I, I think he didn't cope well once he was expected to adopt this more masculine role. So I'd, uh, um, he's a very interesting man because Is I think he? he's got these two <laughs> sides to him. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Like every one of us. <laughs> Anyone else would like to? I'm behind me. Anyone? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Can you tell us your name and where you're from? Um, There's a oh. portable. <laughs> It's for recording. No you worries. Don't, you don't uh, hear what you I'm say. David Jerry Smith from the University of Melbourne. Um, do masculinities work on Indonesia as well? Right. First, just a quick point to that. With the, in the masculinity studies, the idea that liberal masculinities that are negotiating are less masculine wouldn't be accepted. The, they would suggest on, under Connell's mode that it's another kind of masculinity. Obama's not less masculine than Trump, just has a different conception of masculinity. Mm -hmm. They're both fully successes in their own form. Um, my question was to, to Sarah and Honey about whether hegemony fails in masculinity and about the men's movement in East Timor and about the male educators. From your observations, to what extent do these examples show chances where masculinity is being deconstructed or just that hegemonic arrangements can be tolerant of some degree of divergent performance, right? That in some of these instances, you can be more caring as long, but that doesn't necessarily lead to you challenging and deconstructing the dominant form. The dominant might totally accept you being nice to children sometimes, because that doesn't challenge their power. Mm. But are you seeing instances where these alternate performances fundamentally disrupt what, what the dominant is to be a man? Yeah. Mm. Before you answer that, I just remind everyone, unless somebody get confused or dis, uh, disoriented or frustrated, we have five speakers with very different sort of research projects. I do not aim to have one single focus for entire discussion and what particular one goal or aim. Doesn't matter if you go different places. I enjoy that. <laughs> so feel free to explore the, the, the area. Thank you so much. Now, questions to you, um, Honey, and to you, I think, Sarah, right? Mm. So wanna you want to begin? Mm -hmm. OK. David, your question was about the, the mm. challenge to hegemonic masculinity yes. then. Um, so I, I think, and I've been working with those men in Timor that are challenging it, but it is very difficult for them in that environment. And they do sort of suffer criticism and setbacks and they really don't get a lot of airspace uh, in Timor. But they're there. You know, they are there and they are working and they have got their organisations um, and they haven't gone away. Uh, they did have a lot more support when there was a lot more international funding around than they do now and they are sort of scrabbling around but they're, they're not going away and there, there are lots, once you start looking into this field of masculinities, there are such a variety um, of different ways to be a man in, 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 in these environments that, and these things are being pointed out more often, I, I, I do think it's mo it is moving forward and it is shifting and, and this is an ageing, that the particular group of leaders I'm talking about are an ageing group of leaders. So I do think it's shifting yet. Thanks. Okay, thank you for the question, David. It's, just, um, it's actually the same question that I have <laughs> when I'm analysing my data. And um, I don't think that the incorporation of care and love in to their masculine identity is challenging the hegemonic idea of masculinity in Indonesia because the what is hegemonic is itself it's very very you know complex in Indonesia because there's no one particular standard of what is hegemonic in hegemonic masculinity in Indonesia like from my analysis then I come to conclusion there are keys to hegemonic masculinities in Indonesia, which is uh, men as breadwinner, men as leader, men as protector or hero. But what is a hero, what is a breadwinner, and what is a leader, it's, it's changing. You know, like a good leader in, during the Suharto time is uh, the one with um, military power, but during the Jokowi time, it's more, you know, more you know, like a Javanese, Javanese priyayi with 
mm-hmm. very in, not confronting, but behind that, I don't know what he thinks, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. So um, I do still see that my respondents still complicit to the idea of men has to be breadwinner, uh, leader, and hero, but they frame it in different way, in in more softer than the the traditionally perceived as as masculine idea, like you know, strong, tough, uh, or violence. There's just different way of of you know maybe uh, justifying what they do in the field. Yeah, I'm my disciplinary background is in politics and international relations. But um, having said that, I appreciate the great diversity of the research um, being done in, um, in this panel. I think I'm just building on from the point that David and Lisa raised earlier in terms of really uh, the theme or the idea that brought together is that understanding femininities and masculinities is not a new thing because many scholars have been doing it and the importance has been to emphasize gender as a structural symbolic order that allocates unequal relations of power. And so there has been a lot of discussions on this. And, and, and I think we need to be acknowledging that intellectual depth that it hasn't been a new thing. Although there is certainly a, a, a increasing visibility of the use of masculinity as an analytical frame. Um, and this leads me to another observation in terms of really um, the risk of essentializing or, or um, I guess posing that question to all of the speakers in terms of when we start um, singling out masculinities uh, and femininities versus femininities, are we then obscuring gender order? And this is again, um, I think, a point that is being raised in this panel is that when we talk about care, for example, as a practice, as, as, as an act of, of, of resistance, maybe it doesn't really challenge the gender order because actually masculinities have been performed or coded in caring roles when we talk about paternal leaders and, um, and, and, and strong men, fathers of the nation. They have justified violence, including domestic violence, as an act of care. In some cultures, be- beating your wife is a form of showing love. Um, and so I think um, acknowledging the risk of whether um, are we essentializing um, through our research, whether it's cultural or biological, and in so, uh, and, uh, and as such, we then obscure once again the spaces for women um, to mobilize and draw political attention to their experiences of violence and insecurity. Um, and perhaps maybe a second point to that is the challenge. Maybe instead of looking at femininities and masculinities, what's the space for sexualities? And this is something that Ben has made me um, think more closely because as far as I know of Indonesian culture in Southeast Asia more generally, religion and indigenous culture reinforces masculinities and femininities in very heteronormative um, ways and that actually precludes a broadening of discussions of what forms of masculinities are actually more progressive and and can challenge the gender order. Thank you. Mm. If anyone would like to respond. I'm happy to respond. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I agree with everything you said, Maria, you know. Um, We've talked before, but uh, yes, understanding as Julian said uh, that really this project has come out of feminism and it has come out of the struggle for gender equality, uh, and masculinities fit squarely in that framework that you described. In fact, I listened to a really interesting paper at a mis- masculinities conference recently that was talking about how they were looking at projects, sort of big international gender projects around the UN and and the, how the funding for those projects hasn't increased, but masculinities has been biting into that pie, so there's actually less amount of funding going to feminist projects and to into projects trying to redress the, the, the gender balance, um, and that it's a real issue for masculinities. Uh, Usually mascu- these masculinities projects are talking about gender equality, but not always, actually. And they're taking a slice of the pie from, from other uh, projects working on gender equality and, and um, trying to raise the status of women 
up to the status of men. Mm. So it's a it's a tricky one actually, the masculinities project. Yeah. Right. Effie, do you want to respond to anything at all? We can um, easily forget yeah. you because you are <laughs> <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> no, uh, thanks. That was a very uh, important uh, reminder for me as a researcher of masculinity. Um, for sure, as Sarah has said, that my project is also originated from um, you know, feminism. And I've, I acknowledge that um, when discussing about femininity, um, we cannot discuss it in isolation. So feminism has been talking about masculinity all the time. But then um, the focus on masculinity as part of solution um, for you know, towards gender equality itself has, uh, what is it, has come a bit later um, in the scholarship. So um, I'm, I'd like to contribute in this um, discussion how masculinity can also be part of the solution for gender equality. Uh, absolutely, um, you know, talking about masculinity cannot be done in isolation. Um, I'm talking about mascul a particular form of masculinity in relation to other forms of masculinity as well as to uh, femininities. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are we still in this topic or mm -hmm. we'll move some? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Honey, you want to go first? Or, no, you go okay. ahead. Um, uh, thank you, Maria. You're right. It's very tricky when we say it about, um, you know, about the discourse of care because the discourse of care can be translated into both you know, masculine frame, like you know, uh, uh, a father will think that, oh, I'm looking for money for my, for my family, that's the form of care that I do. Uh, but in my, in my research, I frame the discourse of care and love in terms of uh, caring for children, like, you know, doing uh, the practices of, for example, uh, feeding the kids or, you know, not playing with the kids. Playing with the kids is already it's it, in 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 the in the in in the parenting framing. Playing is for father, like you know, caring, mm. <laughs> changing diaper, things like that. <laughs> it's for the mother. So uh, it's it depends when we use the discourse of care mm. and love. It depends on how we frame it in the in the writing. You write it's uh, you know, caring itself can be both. <laughs> masculine and feminine. Yeah, thank. That's such an important comment. And it just kind of reminds me that, I mean, you can never kind of contextualize um, these, these ideas enough, right? Even what we mean by gender, as you're saying, kind of gestures towards this, um, you know, feminist intellectual genealogy that I think c can, can never be recognized enough um, in kind of how pivotal it, it has been to formulating scholarship which is more closely attuned to, to these questions of inequality, right, which is at the end of the day what we're talking about. In terms of sexuality, what I'm interested in is, again, you know, the kinds of logics that say a, a kind of Western hegemonic perspective, if you take that and you bring that to, to scholarship and you, and, or the, the, the empirical context that you're working on, what that can do, in fact, is just create all kinds of silences, right, and all kinds of um, non-possibilities, I'd call them. Right, so in my case, the idea of the sex worker or the prostitute, right, is always coded feminine in, in, in scholarly discourse and in lots of development discourse as well. But of course, there are many males who participate in sex work economies. The way in which they do so, uh, the kinds of intimacy they, they, they require, the kinds of uh, monetized relationships, the spaces that they emerge in, we know, ne n you know next to nothing about. I find that quite amazing and, and kind of just reiterates uh, your, your point that we need to be really cautious exactly about what we're talking about and in what way. I suppose I see was raising hand. Do you want to say something? Still on the topic, Mark? Very still, quick, st still on the topic that we're discussing yeah. or something else? Um, <coughs> sorry, my name is Hashim Abdul Hamid from Monash Caulfield. Um, it is interesting to note uh, that the topic of the discussion was basically on masculinity. In my way of thinking, masculinity, masculinity can be translated as kelakian atau kejantanan. <laughs> the two meanings are different from each other. Mm. Maleness and, of course, 
and leaders. <coughs> and of course, in my part of the world, some 73 years ago, in Malaysia, the neighbors are beating their wives. It's an accepted thing, you know, for the simple reason. The majority of the women, they're not highly educated. But things are changing now. Education seems to have changed. And the women seem doing, doing, to be doing very, very well because of the education, the employment they get, and the money they earn. They consider themselves as equal. On the other hand, in area like Minangkabau, if you were to study the history of the Indonesian people, the women rule the house, rule the villages, and virtually make the men sit in the corner and cower in fear of the wives. <laughs> I don't know whether this is appreciated and so on and so forth in this part of the world. What I mean here in Australia, since 73, I noticed my neighbors, be men, beating their wives for the reason of being drunk or whatsoever, the excuses. And in retaliation, within 10 to 15 years, things are changing. Women are working, earning good money, driving their own cars, and so on and so forth. And what happened is that things are changing. So when we discuss about masculinity, I tend to think of two terms, as I said earlier, uh, laki lakian and uh, jantanan. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a general comment. Yes, please. Could you tell us your name and uh, where Jennifer, you're from? I'm a retired professional. Oh. Jennifer, I'm a retired professional. I actually live in Melbourne Uni, and I have a number of Indonesian students out on Oz study, as it was, as tenants. And I must say, I couldn't speak, I know it's anecdotal and a select group, but I couldn't speak more highly of their, their attitude towards me, their respect and sensitivity. Mm. One of them said his mother told him, remember, she's an older woman, be very kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I've anyway I have been to Indonesia but I've met a number of Indonesian students I feel very warm to them because I had such a wonderful experience of my tenants who are also so incredibly honest and thoughtful and um, what, what they love about the present president of Indonesia is that he's equal and I wonder if hierarchy it creates people a bit set in their ways and causes insecurity and whether you can talk about gender equality without addressing the societal inequalities, mm -hmm. class, etc. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this Masuda would be best <laughs> position to answer that question. No, 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 no. Would anyone would like to answer that question or respond? I'd like to add to it. Please. Then, there's another dimension too, and that's regional. And I, I was going to follow up in terms of David and Sarah's comments and that their different perceptions is really that, you know, if you're going to look at Indonesian history, you have to look at the fact that there are so many different cultural circles that, um, you know, even within one island, you can have so many different cultural perceptions and, and traditions. And, you know, gender is one element that, it, that it's reflected within as well. So Timor is just so different to the Minang, for example who are matrilineal. Mm. So I don't think we can just say the Indonesians had this perception on gender. Mm. You, you just cannot say that. It's inaccurate. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, you need to have the microphone for recording. <laughs> There's no speaker, but for recording. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Patience. I was an undergraduate here about 100 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm now, now in political science at that other place in Carlton. Um, I'm, I found this really interesting, a very interesting discussion. But it's made me wonder about two things. First of all, would a comparative perspective on other Asian cultures be useful in this discussion? I'm thinking of Japan, which I know fairly well, for example, or China or yeah. Korea yes. uh, and Thailand, for example. Uh, the whole <coughs> gender discussion is, is one that would bring in a compar comparative perspective there would be a danger of reifying the Indonesian masculine experience if we don't bring in a broader perspective. And I think, too, there's some interesting parallels in masculinity in Australia mm -hmm. uh, that we, we could usefully bring into the discussion. Mm. And especially the militarization of men 
uh, and and the whole role of men and I mean from the British imperial experience of being soldiers for the empire through to now being um, Donald Trump's lackeys and so on. <laughs> uh, so I'm just wondering about that. And finally, I'm wondering about the cost of masculinity, which I think is often overlooked. And I'm thinking here of some of the data about Australian boys and men. Uh, high suicide rates amongst young boys and men. Um, appalling accident rates, the highest, I believe, uh, uh, in all the OECD countries on sports fields, for example, men playing sports with each other. And here I note in particular, the kind of masculinization of women being brought into this uh, with women's football, for instance. Yeah. But also um, uh, a whole range of other uh, fairly um, mm. worrying data mm. about mm. the way in which mm. young men are struggling to be young men mm. in the Australian context. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Since you are the expert on J Japan, could you say a few words about, <laughs> about how masculinity is understood, addressed, and perhaps glorified differently than what you have heard uh, um, from Indonesia this one? Oh, well, I'm not an expert on Japan. Okay. I've, I've lived there for about 10 years. Okay. But, uh, but um, in, in my university, for example, um, the way in which boys, ad late adolescent and early 20s boys, presented themselves from a Western perspective would be remarkably ambiguous. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of, mis a lot of Westerners make mm. some very serious errors yes. in observing what they think is feminine behavior mm. amongst boys and so yes. on. But, yes. but, but uh, in, in the tales of Genji, for example, there is some, something like eight genders mm. uh, talked mm. about. Uh, and I believe that's true of Japanese. Yeah. Culture, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Please. I, I think that this long chapter of Ray Wen Connell's about the history of masculinity talks a lot about some of the things you raise and especially about the association of masculinities and nationalisms and the sort of hegemonic masculinity within those sort of political movements. But also the cost. I actually have a couple of lines in um, the articles I've been writing which the World Health Organization have costed out some of these um, you know, economic costs of masculinity in, in accidents and uh, suicide rates and health costs, risk-taking behaviour, the cost of risk-taking behaviours. But of course, Raywan Connell started writing about the sports fields of Australia. That's where her whole um, ideas of masculinity came from. So, uh, from rugby clubs in Sydney, I think, was it, David? Uh, I So I think that's been explored, but I th also think your point about class too is really important because the men that I'm talking about in Timor are the elites. They're the elite hegemony, they're top, top of the pile. So yeah, it is hard to talk about any of this without talking about class as well, I think. Thank you. David, I was just wondering if you can share with us a bit about your research. If, you know, if I'm lucky enough to have met you earlier, I would have invited you to be one of the speakers. <laughs> I'll actually talk about the stuff I've been doing with Buddha. Um, you have a microphone. Yeah, please. Yeah. So me, me and Huda have been doing a bit of work on how men leave the networks and about how masculinity impacts on making it easier or harder for you to leave the jihadi network after you've been involved for a long time. And picking up on the comment before about class and location, I think one thing that we've seen with a couple of the participants, this is a small group of life history work with these guys. Um, I'm thinking particularly about one participant from Bali and uh, one from Western Java, about how men from marginal locations within Indonesia, so lower class group, or from marginalized ethnic groups in comparison to the elites within the network that are sort of centered around central Java and Jakarta, are both the biggest risks and, and costs of masculinity are placed on them, as in they're given the shit jobs that you get caught and punished for. They're then not rewarded when they go to prison, they're not supported in the prison network, their families are marginalised and are not given support, so that organisations like Hooters have to help provide economic support for the children and wife to, to survive. And then when they leave the network, they find themselves in, in this tremendously precarious position because they're either marginalised on the basis of ethnicity or class, they no longer have membership in their community in the same way because they've been fingered as 
a jihadi, but then the network is not willing to support them because they're not part of these elite men in the center of the jihadi network. So this confluence of location, ethnicity, class, costs of masculinity, they get told the myth of the ummah and the brotherhood that they come in, be a brother, and you'll be supported by all of us equally. Mm. But then they get given the worst job and none of the rewards, and they end up in this incredibly precarious position. I think we need to take very seriously the way in which masculinities are multiple and that masculinity is as much about the oppression of men by other men as it is believe, the oppression of women by men as a group. And in the Indonesian context, those dynamics are very complex in the way of location, class, ethnicity, l linguistic group. That's, it's, it's needs to be taken very seriously how those hierarchies sediment and how they produce patterns of, of power and oppression. And I, I think Huda's been talking about that a bit already. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other response come in? Could I, could I ask Please. You? Sorry, uh, I have a question for uh, Ali on the topic that actually that Alan just raised uh, about the um, about the economics of it. Do the do the men, the small minority of men training to be in uh, early childhood education, do they ever think of themselves as bringing something distinct or different or special to to their profession? The reason I ask that is because now in Australia we're going through this process whereby we're kind of critiquing professions that are heavily gendered mm -hmm. and saying, look, the productivity might be so good if, if without an even, uh, without an even yeah. uh, spread of sexes, or that there's some, there's some kind of uh, you know, inefficiencies involved in that. And particularly we're seeing it now with boards, company boards. Mm -hmm. I think academia, we've been through that. There's a, there's, a, there's a bit of that critique and we're trying to make it a project of ours to make, to make the workspace more, more, um, more equal in terms of its uh, se representation of sexes. Do that, do they, so we have here a workforce that's very uh, oriented to, to female workers. Do you find that um, men say that they can bring something special to the to the profession? Uh, yeah, I did ask. I did ask that question to my respondent, and they said that um, yes, they bring something different to the profession. They said that uh, they. Well, this is the ambivalence of what they are, um, you know, the ambivalence in their narrative about their masculinity themselves. At first, they they embrace the love and care perspect, um, discourse as their masculine identity. But then, if you remember when I said uh, brain versus heart, Indonesia need more heart. But then when I asked specific question about do you, as a man, bring something different to this uh, to the school? He said, "Yes." Uh, he said like this: "Children needs balance of how to think rationally and how to uh, to be to embrace emotional uh, mm -hmm. quality." Mm -hmm. So, me as male teacher give them the balance because <laughs> if they're yeah if, if if there's only female in this field then the children will not have any model of how to be rational so that's very <laughs> strong <laughs> so i found a lot of you know paradox ambivalence in their mm. in their narratives but I think, as Susan Brenner also found, it's always like that. Like, gender is not, you know, this or that, or uh, either this or that. But it's always, you know, dynamic, dynamic and there's ambivalence. In, uh, it depends on the context when you ask and how you ask about it. When I ask about specifically, uh, as a man, do you bring something to this field? I am straightforward asking about his masculine, you know, sense. So he will talk about all of these masculine, you know, this, what the society perceives as masculine uh, quality. But when I ask it a little, bit, a little bit differently, like, what is your concern about this? Uh, about our country, about this nation. Then he said that we need more heart. We, need, <laughs> we have a lot of brain and yeah, we need more, 
people with empathy, things like that. So <laughs> it's a, it's and also like uh, researching masculinity is very very to me is very difficult in a way that I don't want to essentializing like which one is feminine, which one is masculine, but at some point we need that to be you know to analyze thing whether it's well this is is it masculine is it is it feminine but i am aware that it's, it's the risk of essential <laughs> essentializing it that reminds me of my consultation with effie actually <laughs> that question <Yeah. laughs> you want to say something <laughs> yeah <laughs> you remind me of uh what is it um the risk of reification which I'm still thinking about it, how to deal with it. I think I, I have to acknowledge um, that even though that the idea of Bapaism is very much hegemonic, it is never, um, it is never applied similarly across the nation, across Indonesia. And um, like, for example, in terms of breadwinning masculinity, um, the, what is it, men in, Nusa Tenggara, Timur, um, and also men of lower class in Java have been have not been. I mean, some of them may not be um, the breadwinners of the family, and maybe um, their their wives who are migrant workers uh, are the breadwinner, the actual breadwinners of the family. But then, I acknowledge that the 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 representation in the cinema um, has a middle class aspiration that the idea of men as breadwinning is now challenged and the cinema is new and this is a middle class aspiration and um, uh, especially from the urban area and um, it is given a different meaning maybe for uh, the lower class and also for the less educated that men are not breadwinner is a rational decision well that's fine because you couldn't do that but then for the middle class um, young middle class educated people it is like more um, ethical uh, decision because they're informed with uh, modern discourses of feminism and stuff. Just for those of you who are not familiar or who, with Indonesian cinema, I dare say if I am allowed to make some generalization that since about the, the year 2000, in a lot of Indonesian films, the men are the losers. The men are confused <laughs> and could not make decisions. <laughs> Around from the year 2000, really. Um, for whatever reasons. I'm sure there's more than one reason. I'm sure there's some exceptions. But in general, you didn't see that before that, that period. Okay, anyone from, from the side? If you want to say something or comment? One more over there. Okay, one more from there. <laughs> Can you speak with microphone? Just for recording, please. Um, I'm Anita Dewi from Monash University Library. I'm interested in Hani's project. Um, you interviewed the man, the male one, right? It would be interesting if, n maybe not for P PhD project, but another project, <laughs> to actually interview the female workers, the teachers, did. you did, yeah. and how they view the, um, the brain or heart <laughs> and how <laughs> the masculinity coming into their space that would be really good if, if you yeah. can just uh, briefly share it with us. Sure. Well, I uh, I interviewed the colleagues of the male teachers because in kindergarten, in one class, they usually have two teachers: one uh, the primary teach, uh, the main teacher, and one assistant teacher. So I I interviewed the pairs and uh, the uh, the school principal paired them like one male teacher and one uh, female teacher. So when I asked the female teacher, their colleagues about, you know, what do you think about your colleague, your, your male colleague? And, and uh, they said, very interesting comment. They said that, oh, I love working with men more than working with women colleagues. Why? <laughs> It's very stereotypical. <laughs> <laughs> it's more difficult to work with 
women because they're so sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> they, it's easily, it's, they are so easy to be offended. With men, I can easily ask them to do this and that without any questions. Okay. So without the man questioning, what's this for? <laughs> so the man just more do obedient. what? Yeah, more obedient. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of the Andalusia, yeah? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the men in my research, according to the female colleague, it's more obedient. And then in my observation, I I saw it. I saw it. It's really like, you know, in one activity, the female teacher teach the, the children how to climb a uh, tire a wall of tires like very high around two meters and then uh, the teacher need to demonstrate it to the children so the til children can do it and the female teacher asked the man who, uh, to do it and then the man me me doing that yes you do that with with you know with with hesitation but he did it anyway <laughs> he did climb the, <laughs> climb the wall and in every physical activities like baseball things like that the men usually be the one who demonstrate the activity yeah. and the, the the female teachers is in charge you do this you do this part <laughs> yeah. so it's um it's very interesting to see and yeah the female colleagues very welcome and happy with 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 their, uh, with their existence because they don't question the power of the 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 female teacher. Mm. While when there's female teacher and female teachers, they question, they question each other. <laughs> they compete. They compete. Okay. Yeah. Can, can I turn to Huda? And yes. What about the female jihadis? Yes, I was about to say this. Yes. You know, like uh, we tend to think that, okay, woman will, okay, I, 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 I think to follow up what Maria said about gender order, or I don't want to essentializing, okay, that's a specific attribute that's belong to men or woman or in the network. One of my correspondent, female correspondent in within the jihadists, to my surprise, we think that, okay, woman can help men to stop not to do the violence. To my surprise, they said, no, I prefer to see my husband in the network. Because in that get pressed this. So, and then it shocked me, you know. So sometimes then, okay, women in specific cases, okay, they can be an agent of change for peace, but in many cases also they radicalize. Uh, even like uh, within the, the jihadists, they have their own lullaby, which is talking about, you know, you have to continue your father's work. Mm -hmm. And there are many cases now, especially if you look at now with the ISIS, there are many children of Indonesian foreign fighters during the Afghan who continue their father's step. So it's only the uh, the continuation. Mm -hmm. So kinship play a very important role, and this is the role of women, mm -hmm. sadly. Yeah. Thank you. I'll make a last call if anyone who still would like to say yes. Yes, Inta. Yes, um, I want to go back to, I think, the most interesting statement today by Mas Arya. I'm going to read that again. Since 2000, Indonesian cinema uh, <laughs> seen <laughs> men as losers. Uh, I think there is uh, an essay or even a book behind that. Uh, that's, uh, I'm sensing that it's going to happen because Mas Arya will have to respond and do research about that. But I'm throwing this to Effie. Uh, could it be because a number of things, number one, so also going back to Julian, Julian said something about uh, men get the idea or women get the idea of ideal behavior from cinema. We very much influence, you know, think of Kardashian and that sort of rubbish from America. <laughs> but I'm going to turn that though. Uh, looking at the booming of Indonesian films and it's amazing and I'm looking forward for the future of Indonesian films, could it be because the media, the, the cinema uh, can be used as a tool, medium, or a site of activism to, to challenge, to debate, to stir up uh, trouble, if you like. And I think uh, it could be one of the sec successful, uh, effective, I might say, uh, um, medium for Indonesia or Indonesianists to talk about this. 
Please, Evie. Uh, uh, thanks a lot. It's very interesting. Indeed, cinema has been used as um, a tool of activism um, in Indonesia. So it's challenging the um, dominant norms and also uh, challenging the hegemonic masculinity. Um, as I said earlier, but in terms of commercial cinema, it's still, you know, it's still um, rife with suspicion whether um, commercial cinema can be front to challenge the dominant norm. Where, when I say uh, yes, um, partly I would argue that the uh, flourishing of women's cinema in Indonesia is part of the cost that uh, even those who uh, those film directors or uh, filmmakers who are not, um, you know, activists, for example, who, like, you know, Hanung Bramantio is also concerned with the idea of masculinity, how an ideal masculinity should be portrayed these days. Um, it is not only Nia Dinata, Luki Kuswandi, and uh, those but who are called like ideal or feminist or um, activist filmmakers who are currently trying to uh, be part of this reconfigure uh, uh, of the attempt of reconfiguring um, hegemonic masculinity these days so it's it has um, attracted more um, people more, more filmmakers who may not have the background of activism thank you I now would like to turn to the speakers all of you and to say a few last words, if you have any messages for anyone who would like to continue your path, your work on masculinity. Do you have any particular advice, <laughs> tips, what to do and not to do? Um, <laughs> how would you like to see the future of study of masculinity in Indonesia and East Timor to move forward? Anything you want to say? I'd be interested in hearing from Ben a little bit more about what um, the field of transgender studies Please. has to offer this particular kind of discussion about masculinity and gender, because I think that's a real kind of point of interest in your work. Well, well, I think that um, in general, Indonesian, I mean, as we've discussed, perhaps the study of masculinity or gender studies has been a relatively neglected field, although there has been some investment. I think even less in, say, transgender studies and queer studies. And I think what we have here is obviously a kind of complex set of politics, but thinking about queer and transgender as analytical frameworks. Right, so moving beyond this idea that only gay people have a sexuality, right, or only transgender people have a gender identity, right, that can be crossed and is flexible. I think taking those kind of key ideas yes. and transferring them across into yes. kind of all kinds of studies of masculinity and femininity in Indonesia is really important, and 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 certainly something that I would like to see more of. Wonderful, thank you. Any? In, in my set, I think uh, we need to study more on gender. It has to do with a uh, spirit of equality, because in the end of the day, we cannot study masculinity without looking at the inequal, you know, inequality what happening within the woman side. Because this is I take it for granted. I don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think this is some sometime. You know, it's time I read about some uh, on this very particular, very masculine, hyper masculine masculinity in my subject within jihadism. I always think of my man, what is the impact, what is the woman position in this issue? And it is, it takes me very painful to understand, you know, how it's to link this, you know, because all the book, all literature, especially I'm looking at all the political Islam, which is very much dominated by male, male discourse. Honey, <laughs> you want to say anything at all? Mm, I think not. Okay. Sarah? <laughs> Well, I guess I just hope that um, masculinity studies grows in East Timor because there isn't a lot of it. And I think it would be really beneficial um, to the country and to the new nation that's being formed, really, to reflect on this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and to that end, I'm having a whole day of gender papers at our Timor-Leste Studies Association conference in Dili in June, and some of them will be hopefully, about masculinities. But what else would be great, and that's what um, uh, we, we did have a previous panel on masculinities in Indonesia and East Timor a few years ago, and just that link between the two places, because there's lots of similar, obviously similar cultural uh, connections. So it would be great to see that connection being kept up. Effie, a few um, final words? 
Uh, final words. <laughs> I'd like to see more research about, um, you know, masculinity, about engaging men and making masculinity as part of the solution to gender equality. Hopefully. Hopefully. Now I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, Associate Professor Julian Milley, to have his concluding remarks for this session. Well, I, I only want to say uh, thank you, Ariel, for organising a, um, a terrific discussion, and thank you, everyone here, for for attending. Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's a mar it's a it's a marvellous field, and I think I should point out that uh, the scholars we have here, and I'm close really to two, and that is Noor Huda because he's my colleague here, and also Sarah. One thing about their work is it's not a very new thing for them. They've in fact been working on these things for a long time, and they have a lot of relationships and a lot of um, a lot of successful events and engagements in the societies they work with. And in fact, they're both truly amazing, to be honest, uh, for, for what they've done over a long period of time. And I think that that's maybe one thing about this field of study that perhaps we should think about too, is that to, to make the relationships with people and so on, it's not, a, it's not something that happens overnight. And I know Ben's been also developing relationships, and Honey, of course, is from an institutional context that's the same, and uh, I assume Effie as well. So I think that's another thing that deserves recognition here. Apart from that, thank you very much. So what, what I suggested earlier was that, that not that masculinity has not been discussed, but it has not been, to repeat your word, hegemonic. A critique of hegemony, uh, uh, sorry, a critique of masculinity has not been hegemonic enough, I think. Mm, <laughs> we yeah. should, <laughs> it's not been central, so to speak. Uh, when you talk about gender, it tends to be directed to women, or, you know, and, and equality, but mm. as if men has no problem, as, you know, out there. <laughs> so, uh, this is now the time for me to thank all of you, the speakers particularly, and Julian, the commentator. I'd like to also acknowledge the support from the anthropology colleagues, particularly um, Dr. Naril Warren, who introduced me to Zoo. Is he around here? No. Uh, okay, in her absence. Also, I'd like to thank Professor Andrea Whitaker, who is not well, and she apologized for not being able to be with us today. Um, I'd like to also thank the School of Social Sciences, particularly Shireen Fernando, who is the school executive officer for all kinds of support she has given us um, for this event. I'd like to also thank David, who's been working hard before we enter the room, as well as the Richard Ross for making the Zoom as a great success. So thank you everyone, and we hope to meet again sometime. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>